Thank you very much, Carlos, for this introduction. And it is, uh, it is my great pleasure to introduce you to Jojo Fon. Jojo is a Jesuit from Malaysia, from the island of Sabah, and he's a theologian and an anthropologist. And he has worked for many years with indigenous communities in Asia, especially in the Philippines and, and Malaysia. Last year, he was a visiting fellow at Campion Hall, and he wrote a book on connecting indigenous spirituality and shamanism with its nation spirituality. Jojo has some connection problems, so we will be listening to his recorded presentation. And after his um, pre uh, recorded presentation, uh, Masuda Bano will, um, will give a short response from her own perspective. So Masuda is Professor of Development Studies in Oxford. She has worked on the role of ideas and beliefs in development processes and their evolution and change. And recently she has been leading um, a major research project on changing structures of, the Islam of Islamic authority and the consequences on social change. And she's now working on, on education. But Masuda has had a very long um, expertise in, in Asia, working with, within Islam and, and education system in, in Asia. So without further ado, I'll, um, I'll pass on to Becky for the, uh, for the video. Hi there, thanks to La Dato C Research Institute and Campion Hall for this invitation to a conversation on the politics of land, insights from Asia. I would uh, speak on the insights of, insights of Asian uh, indigenous peoples uh, in the light of Fratelli Tutti. So uh, there are three sections I would, uh, I would present. One is, in terms of encroachment by global or national interests, to is government policies to be in, influenced by social justice and uh, um, people's response to land dispos dispossession. And third is land reform. Just briefly on the global context, indigenous peoples constitute about 80% of a global indigenous population of 302.45 million, which makes up approximately only 4.4% of the global population and about 10% of the global poor. In the complex web of antithetical, heterogeneous, variegated situations of urban, peri-urban, rural, educated, property, wealthy, in dire poverty, empowered, disempowered, and dispossessed. So it's rather complex, actually. And uh, we have a special focus on India, and for me, it's really on Jakan, on the Adivasi, um, who are the earliest inhabitants as early as 2000 BCE. And if you look at this map of India, you see the red dot in the subcontinent of India, and that's Jharkhand. And this is the entire map of Jharkhand, the autonomous region of the Adivasi people. Roughly, the Adivasis of India is about 104.3 million, 86% of the 1.4 billion population. So Central India is home to the country's largest Adivasis and taken as a whole, roughly about 75% of India's tribal populations live there in the Jharkhand. What does is, what is the earlier picture of the landmass of uh, Jharkhand? Well, it is more of a Neolithic culture of forest-based civilization. The land under Sweden cultivation was very common, only in some pockets, plow agriculture was introduced by the medieval jungle states. Notion of land belonging to the king was totally absent. 
community enjoyed total control over the land and forests and their producers. Forests was an integral part of the economic system. Forests were dense and full of wild animals. Forests are the dwelling place of the deceased ones or the ancestors. When the village is settled by clearing forests, a patch of the virgin forest is kept untouched, but they believe that it is the abode of the Mother Earth or Lady of the Sacred Grove and other spirits. This sacred grove is the only place of propitiation of the benevolent spirits of all the indigenous peoples of Jarkin. Let's look at encroachment by global or national interests. With the Jarkin form in 2002, industrialization, urbanization has turned Jarkin into what is known as internal colonies by Gadgil and Guha even Felix Paddle too, of India. Its territory and resources exploited to the hill by the national elites who engineered the Bombay plan of 1944 to 1945 with its mixed economy. According to Sama Busso Mulek, director of the Jarakan Jangal Bacho Andolan, national interest was the lock-in name and development became the password to have a smooth access to the natural resources of the country for their inhuman exploitation and criminal expropriation. Public servants, police, and politicians formed a nexus to this end. Where colonialism left off, development took over, while dams and mines displaced millions of peasants and tribals, destruction of forests caused hunger and destitution. The swelling multitude of ecological refugees who constitute about one third of the Indian population were turned into sweat laborers and treated as a dirt of development, unfortunately. In Jharkhand alone, 1,500,000 people have been displaced so far and 1,500,000 acres of the ancestral land have been alienated from them. Development in Jharkhand has been taking place under the threat of guns. Behind the repression that accompanies development lies a perception of the Adivasi, Adivasi peasantry as physical obstacles in the drive to gain full access to land, raw materials, and natural resources. In Jarkhand, I believe the politics of land is inseparable from the politics of constant contestation that is not unrelated to the systemic human antagonism in capitalism, which Laudato Si insightfully identified as a technocratic paradigm in numbers 106 to 114. So the encroachments are megadams, such as the coal, caro, multipurpose project, the erstwhile multipurpose hydroelectric projects, such as the, Damad, the Damodar Valley Corporation and Sabarnan Reka multipurpose project in the jargon, they already have displaced about 800 million persons from their homes and hearts with the loss of almost 25 million acres of forest land. Jharkhand has more than 25% of the total coal reserve of India and over 80% of it lies in the Damodar River Basin where the Damolda River Valley is now dotted with coal mines that produce 60% of India's medium grade coal, with 33 limestone mines, five copper mines, and 84 mica mines along the banks of Damolda. And the lower valley of Damolda had a 65% cover, forest cover in the past. Sadly, today it stands for a meager 0.05%. Between 1950 and 1941, just in 41 years, mining displaced about 2.6 million people in the country, and about 52% of those displaced were the IPs. During 1998 to 2005, 216 mining projects were granted forest clearance annually, as against 19% during 1980 to 1997. Government estimates put the total forest land diverted for mining across the country in the period of 1980 to 2005 at 95,003 hectares. A total of 100 and 
1,198 mines were granted forestry clearance, or I think it's a repeat, yeah? So this ecological uh, devastation has completely broken the chains of food security. According to the official estimate, 10% of the Jakun population today suffer from hunger frequently and 2% suffer from chronic hunger. Displaced peasants and tribals have become ecological refugees who are about one third of the Indian population with an estimated total of almost 16,000 displaced in the jargon from the year 1951 to 1995. The just development policies as we come to uh, the second part need to be really inspired by social justice and the voices or people responds to dispossession. I think it will, it will do good to draw some inspiration from Pope Francis in his latest book, Let Us Dare to Dream. He states, true change comes about not from above, but from the margin where Christ lives. To go to the margin in a concrete way, as in this case, allows you to touch the suffering and the wants of a people but also allows you to support and encourage the potential alliances that are forming. And in terms of the populist sentiment of what I call the culture of defined resistance and resilience, there's a saying, bichli bati kapua, dipri bhakti abwa, which means we do not want electricity we are happy with our kerosene blend. Injustice is due to rapid industrialization, construction of big dams, transportation network, mining, and some other development projects, projects has caused wanton damage to the local resource base of tribal people, according to Professor Victor Tiga, Vice Chancellor of Sido Kanu University in the Jerkan on behalf of his people. In line with Amadya Singh and Jean Dredge, I think the government policies need to promote, quote, the demands of social justice, which is integrally linked with the expansion of human freedom and the recognition of the land property rights, right to livelihood resources people's active participation in making policies, that is democracy, human capacities like health and education and social justice, which must also include the agency of women and equal distribution of political power. For Seng and Dredd, it is so important that the government policies bear in mind the basic understanding that the expansion of human freedom and capabilities is the goal for which the growth of GDP, among other factors, serve as important means. Growth generates resources with which public and private efforts can be systematically mobilized to expand education, healthcare, nutrition, social facilities, and other essentials of fuller and freer human life for all. And the expansion of human capability in turn allows a faster expansion of resources and production on which economic growth ultimately depend, unquote. So in sync with Seng and Dredge is that Nadan and Shasha's insights calling for, quote, a process of inclusion that is also developmental in the sense that the outcome of inclusion is a superior state of well-being, which I agree. More concretely, at the level of people's life, Alex Eka and Adivasi, director of the Xavier Institute of Social Service, opines that Adivasi should be given the option, quote, for sustainable or alternative development practices like organic farming, the community-based micro hydro and thermal power generation, herbal and traditional medical practices for healthcare and weavers cooperatives in the cottage industrial industry sector, unquote. Now, in terms of the people's movement's voices, Namada Bacho Andolan has this call for a democratic, eco-socialistic 
economy with decentralized planning. The chip core movement demanded agro and forest produce based industry and replacement of the forest department with cooperatives of local people, village councils, and forest councils. The Niamgiri movement advocates tribal rights over livelihood resources and indigenous cultures and strongly opposed mining, emphasizing a sustainable way of life in symbiosis with nature. The policy is to be inspired by justice, according to Pope Francis in his address while he visits the Amazonian Indians in Chile and Peru, it must be severed from the technocratic paradigm that regards indigenous homeland as an, in, as an inexhaustible source of supplies for other countries without concern for its inhabitants and indigenous homeland. Again, that policy must be divest from the distortion of certain policies aimed at the conservation of nature without taking into account the men and women that hoard great expenses of woodland and negotiate with them, leading to situations of oppression for the native people that resulted in the loss of access to land and its natural resources, which strangle her peoples and provoke the migration of the young due to the lack of local alternatives. If we look at Fratelli Tutti in number 168, really policies that are based on neoliberalism and marketplace will be criticized for simply reproducing itself by resorting to the magic theories of spillover or trickle as the only solution to society problems with little appreciation of the fact that the alleged spillover does not resolve the inequality that give rise to new forms of violence threatening the fabric of society. Again, the, in number one, six ed fraternity to the advocates a proactive economic policy directed at promoting an economy that favors productive diversity and business creativity, and thus makes it possible for jobs to be created, not cut. And continue, in addition to receiving a sound political life that is not subject to the dictates of finance, we must put human dignity back at the center and on that pillar, build the alternative social structures we need. This is so important. A number 222, advocating for indigenous people, practically said, indigenous peoples are not opposed to progress. Yet there is a different notion of progress, often more humanistic than the modern culture of developed peoples meant to benefit the powerful, those driven to create for themselves a kind of earthly paradise for the few. In the Fetri Tutti 122, development must not aim at the amassing of wealth by just the few, the elites, but must ensure human rights, personal social, economic, and political, including especially the rights of nations and peoples as a whole. The goal, the global commons and the common good of the dispossessed dictates that the right of some to free enterprise and market freedom cannot supersede the rights of peoples and the dignity of the poor, or for that matter, respect for their natural environment. For if we make something our own, it is only to administer it for the good of all. That is for the common good, especially of the dispossessed and the global commons for all in our common home. In the number 120, the principle of the common use of created goods dictates that a natural and inherent right, right that takes priority over others. All other rights have to do with the goods necessary for the integral fulfillment of persons, including that of private property or any other type of property, should, in the words of St. Paul VI, in no way hinder this right, but should actively facilitate its implementation. And I think policies to be just has to be inspired by solidarity 
as enunciated in 116, which means thinking and acting in terms of community, not dividing and rule. It means that the lives of all are prior to the appropriation of goods by a few. It also means combating the structural causes of poverty, inequality, the lack of work, lack in housing, the denial of social and labor rights. It means confronting the destructive effects of the empire of money. Strong words. And it must be accompanied by solidity in Fraternity 2T1, 2, 3, which is born of the consciousness that we are responsible for the fragility of others as we strive to build a common future. Only in solidarity and solidity can the development be clearly directed to the development of others and to eliminating poverty, especially through the creation of diversified work opportunities. And this is based in one, one, two, uh, on two words uh, in terms of semantic meaning. The Greek word agorthosin, it means expresses attachment to the good, pursuit of the good, striving for excellence and what is best for others, their growth in maturity and health, the cultivation of values and not simply material well-being alone. And the Latin word benevolencia, that wills the good of others, a yearning for goodness, an inclination towards all that is fine and excellent, a desire to, to fill the lives of others with what is beautiful, sublime, and edifying. And uh, to be just, the policy must be influenced by this concept of citizenship found in uh, the document on human fraternity and which is based on the equality of rights and duties under which all enjoy justice and full citizenship and reject the discriminatory use of the term minorities, which engenders feelings of isolation and inferiority, hostility and discord, and takes away the religious and civil rights of some citizens who are thus discriminated against. And finally, in the fraternity number 100, I think the just policies must be in view with the spirit of neighborliness of the Good Samaritan who embraces the bruised and the abandoned person on the roadside, whom the Good Samaritan did not guard, regard as a distraction, an interruption for all that someone hardly important, a nobody, undistinguished, irrelevant to their plans for the future. Let's look at uh, the third theme in terms of land reform. This battleground of land resource contest contestation requires ethics to provide the moral compass for land reform that respond to the common good of the Adivasis in terms of promoting the flourishing of their cultures, social identity, livelihood, food security through just development policies. The first thing that is required of land reform is a perspectival shift from land as terra nullis, which the International Court of Land in 1975 has already overruled, overturned the territories inhabited by tribes or peoples having a social and political organization were not regarded as terra nullis. I think this is very important as pointed out by Frank Brennan. Again, the Frank Brennan advocates the importance of acquisition of land titles rights for self-determination if there's any land reform to take place. Quote, indigenous peoples with land rights and, and modicum of self-determination are individuals and societies with an enhanced choice about how to participate in the life of the nation state and of the global economy while being guaranteed the place and opportunity to maintain their cultural and religious identity with some protection from state interference and from involuntary assimilation into the predominant post-colonial society. Actually, when you look at Karo Upadaya paper, you will see that there is indeed, you know, uh, native title rights to land 
in terms of the Chodanakpur Tenancy Act of 1908, which actually uh, grants a special, a special tenor category of Bundari Kunkatidas. And then the CNTA provides for the recording of various customary rights in land and other resources, jungle or wasteland, such as the right to take produce and to graze cattle, as well as their rights to reclaim waste or convert into convert land into korga. That means upland, jungle, or wasteland that is converted into a rice land by terracing or embarking, but in the legal parlance, it refers to any land reclaimed by radiats of a village who are not kunka tidars. Now, when we look at Carol's paper, there is all this land reform acts from Chodanapur Landlord and Tenants Procedure Acts of 1879, right up to the Bihar Schedule Areas Regulation 1969, was adopted to amend Section 71 of the CNT Act of 1980 and section 20 of the SPT Act of 1949. All these uh, so-called land reform amendments aim at initiating a process of restoration of land belonging to the members of the scheduled, scheduled tribes, which has been unlawfully ceded by fraudulent means that transferred to members of other communities and castes within the period of the last 30 years from the dead on the date of the said amendments. So there is some attempt actually. But for the Adivasis, according to Sama Buso Mulek, land was considered to be a part of mother nature that demanded regular propitiation of the guardian spirits. Swindon and settled agriculture gave rise to a distinct cultural light along with the spiritual significance of land. The new settlements develop a political system of decision making on the basis of consensus about the usage and management of land. So if we reflect that in the light of uh, uh, Fratelli Tutti number 216, the subject of the culture of the people owning the land is the people. Hence, the importance of the art of the culture of encounter with the indigenous, indigenous people, which calls us as a people, we as a people, should be passionate about meeting others, seeking points of contact, building bridges, planning a project that includes everyone. And this become an aspiration and a style of life for them and for us. And all this, uh, for me, in terms of land reform, must look at the end goal of a polyhedral society stated in Fratelli Tutti number 215, which is symbolized by a many faceted polyhedron whose different sides form a variegated unity in which the whole is greater than the part, a society where differences coexist, complementing, enriching, and reciprocally illuminating one another, even amid disagreements and reservations. Each of us can learn something from others. No one is useless and no one is expendable. This also means finding ways to include those on the peripherals of life, for they have another way of looking at things. They see aspects of reality that are invisible to the center's power where weighty decisions are made. And therefore, intolerance, according to FT120, and lack of respect for indigenous popular culture is a form of violence grounded in a cold and judgmental way of viewing them. No authentic, profound, and enduring change is possible unless it starts from the different cultures, particularly those of the poor and the displaced Adivasi people. Land reforms then begins creating institutional expression of respect recognition and dialogue with the native people, acknowledging and recovering their native cultures, languages, traditions, rights, and spirituality as recognition and dialogue will be the best way to transform relationship whose history is marked by exclusion and discrimination in his address to the Amazonians, Indians in Chile and Peru. Again, according to Profances, the principle of dialogue partners, especially when large projects affecting their lands are proposed, that indigenous, free, 
prior and informed consent be duly obtained, according to Carioca 2. And also according to UNDRIP Article 19, the determinant and legally binding principle of approving or rejecting any plan, project or activity affecting indigenous land, territories and other resources must be sought first. In FT 114, only dialogue engenders the need to respect the rights of peoples and cultures to appreciate that the development of a social group presupposes an historical process which takes place within a cultural context and demands the constant and active involvement of local people from within their proper culture. And uh, land reform must really lend support to what we call the strategic identities advocated by Albert Alejo, a Filipino Jesuit anthropologist. And he explains, we need to allow the unfolding of the many selves in the indigenous people's self-determination. And this could point the way to the corresponding multiple ways that local, national, sectoral, and global actors can engage in conflict or solidarity with these strategic identity assertions. Solidarity work then should and could be diversified, strategized and aligned, but not necessarily simplified in response to the evolving multiple identities which globalization paradoxically both engenders and both endangers and engenders, unquote. According to A. Contreras, the eruption of defiance is in oppos opposition to the concerted efforts of the express solidarity of the church, cause oriented organization, tribal support networks that have fallen into the risk of actually serving as agents of colonization, control, and normalization deployed by the state, hiding behind an image of compassion and legitimized by a discourse of development. And this is something for us to look out to watch out for. Again, I think we must think of in terms of a gender strategic identities, which impinges on land reform to ensure that indigenous women continue to gain more grounds in the clan exogamy and patrilineal inheritance of cultivable, cultivable land alone through communal ownership means of productions and the dependence on forests as livelihood resources which was largely the domain of women and surplus production that has provided women more opportunities to engage in agriculture and gain a foothold in the male dominated economic structure. This I think is very important. And land reform, I would like to summarize, just support the radical ecological dem democracy or in short red or advocated by Professor Asim Srivastava and Ashi Kotari, a framework of social, political, and economic arrangements in which all citizens have the right and full opportunity to participate in decisions impacting their lives, and where such decision-making is based on the twin principles of ecological sustainability and human equity. I believe this land reform and this red should really be complemented by FT 218 on social covenant which states, which calls for the ability recognize, to recognize other people's right to be themselves and to be different. This recognition as it becomes is a culture. And you also need to consider cultural covenant in FT 219, which respects and acknowledges the different worldviews, cultures, and lifestyle that coexist in society. Otherwise, all seemingly noble good will, good will never be accepted by the indigenous communities because they are presented in a cultural garb that is not their own and with which they cannot identify with. Finally, is to say that perhaps this discourse, this conversation, this narrative, this is really symbolized by this man, the Father Stan Swami, because he has embodied the pain, the, the shattered dreams, 
the wounded earth, the forest torn asunder, the death of the natural world, he has made his own death. Their imprisonment in a totally ruptured world is also his imprisonment. And indeed, if any one of us who throw our weight, our Lord behind the Adivasi and the Dalits like Stan Swami, because he stands with them, he is prepared to face the music and to take the consequence, whatever that may be. Thank you. So I'd like to, uh, first of all, thank um, uh, Jojo for uh, a very interesting uh, presentation, which I really enjoyed uh, listening to, and I had also read the paper. I'll keep my uh, comments uh, brief um, uh, to allow for more discussion, but uh, I think I was asked to make a comment uh, because of my work on Muslim societies and Islam and the Islamic scholarly tradition. Um, and um, I would like to, and what I, I like to sort of uh, come from that perspective, from the Islamic perspective, and the first thing that come across uh, listening to this presentation and reading the paper are the similarities. Um, one, uh, I'm sure nobody would be surprised by this comment, but there's nothing in this, um, uh, in, in the way uh, the whole um, nature is conceptualized or the importance on preserving uh, sort of nature and these tribal communities and the association with the land um, and the proposed solution through land uh, reform. I mean, there's nothing in all these sort of different issues that were covered um, uh, from the Christian perspective as well that I feel are not supported uh, from the Islamic perspective. So first of all, uh, the first thing, thing that I want to really highlight is the shared a shared sort of consensus, I guess, that some of these religious traditions have on social justice and on ensuring that the um, uh, that those who are marginalized um, are protected and there's equality and there's a shared uh, well-being and that land and the environment is protected as well. So. And I think that's, uh, comes, that comes through also through um, Jojo also referenced, uh, referenced that document and Severine also brought that to my attention, a recent uh, like a joint statement by um, uh, Pope Francis and uh, the Grand Mufti of Al-Azhar. Al-Azhar is one of the oldest Islamic scholarly tradition um, in the Islamic world uh, based out of um, uh, Egypt, out of Cairo, um, an uh, uh, institution that was established in the 10th century and still has a very sort of strong following in the Muslim world. Um, and again, the joint statement was highlighting again the shared vision that the two religions tradition have when it comes to these joint goals of establishing human um, well-being, flourishing and keeping a, a special focus on, um, on the marginalized uh, segments of the society. Uh, so, um, so that's one of my first point that uh, the vision is very shared and this emphasis on social justice uh, is very clear. Um, yeah. Secondly, similarly, like I've already made this point about the shared emphasis on preserving nature and land and the uh, the natural resources, because in the Islamic tradition, uh, there's this whole concept that um, uh, man is, um, uh, is sent as the, he's a caliph, he's the um, khalifa, uh, the, the more Arabic accurate word, and which translate as the leader, but it also translates as successor, as, an, as a vicegerent of God on earth. Uh, and through that role, he is responsible for preserving, um, uh, among other responsibilities, he's responsible for preserving the land, the nature, the all the, the the trees, everything that the nature endows, uh, because they're all uh, creations of God. So there's a very heavy emphasis in the Islamic tradition on uh, preserving environment and, um, uh, and natural resources. The problem, however, this is uh, more specific to the Islamic world, but I think uh, for all religious traditions, uh, it, uh, it might apply uh, uh, in the contemporary modern world, is just that the the channels for you know, for translating this idealized conce uh, um, conception of good life or uh, uh, individual and collective well being that the religious traditions give us um, there are no channels to really in, uh, influence policy in light of those goals. Uh, so the problem in the Muslim world right now is Al-Azhar or the Grand Mufti of Al-Azhar who was giving this joint statement with Pope Francis and can highlight all these grand visions of Islam, of equality, social justice, um, egalitarian institutions, preserve, preservation of land um, and of land reform in favor of 
um, of empowering the, um, the more marginalized indigenous communities. He can give all these suggestions uh, and he can sign international documents on, on that uh, committing that Islam wants all these things or promotes all these things. But the channels um, where he can influence Muslim governments, governments in Muslim societies to, to implement um, policies like that or develop policies like that are greatly missing. I don't know. Uh, I somehow, because I work a bit with uh, Se uh, with Severine um, on some of these ideas, and I somehow get a feeling that maybe in the Catholic tradition or the Christian tradition, um, at least in the West, there might be some platforms through which, uh, not on the on the modern states, but at least there might be some channels through which um, the, the, the religious tradition and the modern institutions, they have a dialogue on some of these issues. Um, in the Muslim world, to be honest, it's very difficult for me to tell you that Oh, here are these Islamic scholars talking to, say, environmentalists or talking to these specialized um, uh, groups on land reform. Like, there's simply not that communication happening. And the Muslim scholars are sitting in their own circles, and those who really want ritual and religious uh, knowledge will go to them. They won't go to them for these concerns, which are seen as modern life concerns, and how the society should be organized, how economy should be developed. Nobody goes to the religious scholar for that knowledge. Nobody goes to um, uh, Sheikh Al Azhar to find answers for that. And that sadly is, to be honest, really a legacy of the colonial period, because prior to that, um, it's the same Islamic study circles, which also were responsible for producing modern day scholars, modern subject scholars, whether it's doctors, whether it's these environmentalists, all of that education happened within the Islamic platforms. During the colonial rule, a division happened between what we see as modern schools and universities and uh, the Islamic madrasas, on which I do a lot of work. Um, and, and the result in, of that partition, which continues continues in the post-colonial time to date is that the Islamic scholars are just confined to Islamic subjects, which are about ritual, piety, and they can have this grand conception of Islam, what Islam wants in other spheres of life, but, but they have no influence on the state or market or any of the social institutions because nobody engages these scholars at that level. So that's really, a, um, I, I wonder if you can see the significance of it um, to the presentation here, but since the whole idea of policy and influencing policy in light of these grand ideas was being raised. So I'm just trying to uh, to share a bit of frustration coming from the my work in the Muslim societies that we, you can, Islam can give you this idealized vision, but there are no channels available today to influence either the government or the think tanks um, or um, these NGOs in this light. Because even the think, the think tanks and big NGOs in the Muslim world today are taking their conceptual, conception of good life normally from Western discourse because they're funded often by Western um, donors. So this local uh, Islamic sort of discourse is having very limited influence. So that's one of the points I want to raise here. Um, and then I think maybe one more point and then I, uh, I should leave uh, is this one that... Um, uh, uh, um, yes, and um, uh, I, I think to be honest, I am, uh, I'll leave with this one that I, uh, it's the it's the break between the policy. Yes, sorry, one last point which I did want to make is that while so that we can have this grand vision, the so because there are no channels of communication with the policy framework clearly, the only voices normally you hear on behalf of the Islamists are the loud ones. They are the Islamic political political parties who have their set political agenda. So no wonder that in the Western world, often the Muslim voices you hear are more about, um, you know, they are either violent, they are either asking for um, uh, for anti sort of Muslim kind of um, um, uh, 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 agendas or they are against minority rights. You know, you often hear about blasphemy issues in Pakistan and how, you know, Christians are being maltreated all. And often that's not because Islamic vision is so limited, which as we are arguing is not. A lot of the conceptions are very similar to what was presented today. Um, even good treatment of minorities is very much part of that Islamic conception. But because there are no formal policy channel linked to have this moderate discussion ar um, around Islam uh, and policy, uh, so so the only voices are the street voices, these political parties who come on the street, they get very loud, and they often have a very rigid understanding and an exclusionary understanding and a politically driven understanding of Islam. So that was the last point I just wanted to make that that's a pity that the, the moderate voices don't make it to the policy circle just because that platform isn't there. But I'll finish there. Thank you very much, Masuda. That's um, that's fascinating, and I think that we can come back in the panel uh, on this issue, uh, as you mentioned about the even from the Catholic or Christian circles. The Mauricio, uh, who's been working uh, with Pope Francis on on making the, the voices of uh, the Amazonian people um, into into policy, um, and and Aliela Sarai, you know, we are working with. 
CAFOD and, and CITSE and others to bring the voices at the COP26. Um, so, and it'd be interesting to, to discuss about, you know, having a more interfaith perspective on these things because there are lots of commonalities and, uh, and there's just um, so, so much we, we can do together on you know, the power of collective action. And that's something that, um, that uh, Jojo was also mentioning, that these channels of policy, you have this beautiful discourse of Fratelli Tutti, and then you have the struggles on the ground of the Adivasi people who are trying to, to fight for their values, for their land, for their culture, and, uh, and, and, and how do we match this kind of this, this mismatch between policy and, 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 and ideas and, and values. And I have one. Um, so please put your your questions on the on the Q and A chat. But there is one one question with regard to a significant landmark in India and also in in New Zealand with indigenous peoples and the fact that the river Ganges uh, in in India and the um, the Yamuna uh, River uh, have be, have received the status of a person, and the same in uh, in New Zealand, the um, the I think it's the Wa, Wangari, um, Wanda, Wandarui River uh, has been re, uh, has received the the status of a person, precisely to to how to, to bring these indigenous uh, cosmologies into policy, because the river is is a person. So can you comment on that? Would you see this this kind of landmark um, uh, an illustration of how this value of land in indigenous and, and Islamic and, and Christian perspectives um, being that translated into practice? Or do you see that quite more cynical that is yet another another legal um, legal pronouncement without much effect in terms of the, the policies of the government. Seth, this question is for Giorgio, right? Uh, yeah, for both of you. I don't know if you, you have read Masuda, this, uh, this case in India where the river has been... To, to be honest, I'm, I know, I'm not yeah. that familiar with it. So that's why I was thinking that maybe it's for Giorgio. Mm. And can you do you do you have um do you have examples where these ideas have been translated into policy? Because Masuda, you are a bit you are pessimistic, as you said, no, that exactly not. that you know, people on the street in Islam are always about the blasphemy. You know, we we saw in in Bangladesh um, uh, a boycott of French products because Macron said something about exactly. Islam. <laughs> uh, so that it's so you always see, those, see that those kind of things because the political parties get involved and who knows who's backing them, you know, what's the agenda. So th there you see street power. But for these kind of causes, there's just no channel because you need more regular channels for these kind of, you know, these the kind of issues we are concerned with, social justice, all these other interventions. You need more normal sort of platform for regular engagement, which frankly I'm not seeing I'm not that much in the Muslim world. So there's no street power for planet Earth. <laughs> Uh, hardly, it's, it's not in this part the, of the, the world. The very ground of our being and the very ground that sustains us. No, if you see any in the Muslim part right now, it would be some of the NGO funded ones, which might be genuine, but often have a very Western funded kind of agenda. So then do you understand? So then they're not coming from an Islamic perspective. So they lose out on the on the local uh, mobilization that they could do on the basis of Islam, but they don't do. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. Because they're, they'll be taking this environment uh, kind of agenda, which will come from the UN and that kind of funding. So that discourse is very different. So there's no bridging happening, even in the NGOs and the think tanks of this Islamic uh, discourse and this general discourse on environment and all. Mm. Well, I think that's an avenue to explore further in terms of research, but also possibly action. <laughs> uh, and so, if we can, um, we can go back to to these uh, issues and in, in the panel, um, this uh, in fifteen minutes. Um, just to say that the, the paper of, um, that Jojo presented is uh, will be sent to you, so you have the more. Um, more time to to read and 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 reflect on it. And if you can leave your screen on, if you can all mute yourself and turn the video off and come back to the same platform um, at in ten fifteen minutes, we'll be back at two fifteen with a panel with uh, Marianus who joined us from India, uh, with Sabina who joined us from Bhutan, uh, with Mauricio who joined us from Quito. So we have a very international panel from. From Quito to um, to to Bhutan and uh, and Ranchi. Uh, so see you in 15, 14 minutes.